Does the virus always have to mutate to become less pathogenic? That's one of the biggest questions right now being asked by a scientific community right now in the context of this pandemic, because of course the pandemic is still ongoing. And the big one is, are we going to see potentially an emergence of more pathogenic variants of uh, SARS-CoV-2 virus? This is something that is really worrisome. We've already discussed this concept before in one of our previous videos. We have more information we wanted to share with you on this topic. And we're going to talk about a couple of papers today that relate to this information. And we're also going to talk about what, some of the reasons why the pathogenicity did decrease with the Omicron and what does that mean moving forward with the evolution of the virus going um, forward in the future of, of this pandemic. So my name is Dr. Mikola Rashik of Merogenomics and uh, let's get started on this topic. <clears throat> so the first paper I wanted to talk, talk about, the authors mentioned right off the bat that they believe that the idea that viruses should be mutating to become more or less pathogenic in order to save the lives of the hosts is one of, they believe, is one of the biggest misconceptions uh, in, in the whole idea of uh, evolution of the pathogens. They believe that that's not necessarily the case, doesn't have to be the case. And why do viruses evolve? Obviously, the viruses evolve in order to in order to increase their, their uh, transmission, increase their ability to propagate, really, I should say. And um, there's a couple ways that viruses can achieve that. Number one is, um, is uh, they can become more infectious. And basically, that means they can typically bind the receptors uh, better and therefore infect the cells of interest. And then the other options that the virus can, can, can have is they can become more pathogenic and as a consequence basically the viral load of the virus can increase so then basically there's more agents if you will uh, involved in in infection so that those are a couple options and the authors of this publication of this uh, review they were they're looking at at they were mentioning that it's not standard that viruses always have to evolve in order to become less pathogenic and they brought up an example recent example of the discovery of HIV variant that indeed was more pathogenic. It was discovered in Netherlands and basically it was discovered because certain certain HIV patients they had higher levels of of uh, helper T cells being infected than you would typically expect with HIV and uh, and uh, it turned out that this type, type of HIV virus that was more pathogenic it had something like 300 mutations and uh, evolved over time so it was actually difficult to even understand how it became a pathogenic and we believe that the virus might have uh, came into existence somewhere even in the 1990s and it was until recently that this was even discovered so that's just one example that they brought up so the authors clearly believe in the concept that you could have something what they define as intermittent uh, intermittent increased pathogenicity so, or intermittent virulence. So that means you could, virus could occasionally mutate to become more pathogenic in order to potentially uh, achieve its, uh, its uh, aims, its aims of existence. Now, so what the authors did wanted to see is what happened with the Omicron. And, and we discussed the decreased um, pathogenicity of Omicron before as well. But in this particular review, what the authors did is they looked at uh, different variants in the past and specifically they studied what differentiated Delta, which was probably the most pathogenic variant we had to deal with thus far, and the Omicron. And Delta had a very s specific mutation at this one specific amino acid called proline. And that particular amino acid mutation allowed insertion insertion of a sugar on top of that mutated amino acid and that sugar was close mm, sorry I should say uh, deletion of a sugar so that that deletion of a sugar so sugar was no longer attached to this amino acid in the delta and that particular amino acid this proline amino acid that was mutated in delta which resulted in sugar no longer being attached it led to 
uncovering of the furin cleavage site. And you need to cut the spike protein in a couple places, including the furin cleavage site. That's actually one of the reasons what makes spike protein of SARS-CoV-2 more infectious because it has that furin cleavage, unusual for this family of coronaviruses, furin cleavage site. And Delta mutated in such a way so that that furin cleavage site was even more exposed because you no longer had that sugar molecule blocking it. So it was even easier to be cleaved. And this is what they believe might have contributed to the increased pathogenicity of of the Delta variant. Now what's interesting is that same proline is also mutated in Omicron, but, but there was another mutation that was unique to Omicron in a nearby location, which put back a sugar on an amino acid and that sugar started to block the furin cleavage site. As a consequence, you now reduce the cleavage of the furin, furin uh, cut site on the spike protein. And what that means is that the cells were not as easy to potentially participate in what is referred to as syncytia formation. I've discussed that concept before. And what does that mean? It's basically when, when uh, spike protein interacts with the receptor and and fuses with the cell once a cell is infected it can produce spike proteins those spike proteins can go on the surface of that cell and those spike proteins can then participate in subsequent fusions with with other cells and that's called syncytia basically it's fusion of cells so you instead of having number of different cells independent cells you you end up having one giant cell with multiple nuclei and uh, so that's what's referred to as syncytia. This is very well established that syncytia is, um, is a hallmark of, um, of uh, more severe disease, of COVID, more severe COVID-19 disease. You see syncytia formation in the lung, lung cells of, of infected individuals with severe COVID-19. And because Omicron was less likely to be cleaved, including by also another enzyme called Tempress. It resulted in Omicron mm, less likely to cause syncytia and therefore reduce the pathogenicity, reduce the, the actual and become milder. Omicron had to then be, had to be, instead of um, being taken up by cells via the standard approach with uh, fusing itself with the cells, it had to be almost imagine like it's called um, endocytic pathway but imagine basically like the cell basically creates a bubble around the virus and sucks it inside so that's how omicron uh, had to now more frequently infect its cells so what uh, the authors uh, of course worry about is that omicron could be potentially mutating to then uh, become more pathogenic and one way that it could achieve uh, that the authors discuss in this video is that it's very well known that viruses can recombine, meaning two different independent variants inside the same host could recombine between themselves and become more pathogenic. And that's well known that this can, that this can happen. So uh, now we're going to go back, go to another paper which actually looked exactly at this type of information. And what these authors uh, did is they basically had a, had a, a study method where they could measure both the cell death, because of course, once the cells are infected, eventually that cell will die. So they were able to measure cell death as well as syncytia formation. They use lung cells, which inside the nucleus of those lung cells, the, the, a gene was inserted that allowed the nuclei to fluoresce. So that means basically the nuclei of those cells were fluorescent and then before if the cells were fusing, you could easily monitor that because you could actually see uh, fluorescent uh, nuclei of the, of, uh, inside multiple fluorescent nuclei inside a single cell. So very, very neat, neat method. And what they did is actually they looked at specifically the one individual that they studied. It was an HIV um, infected individual. So this was someone who was immunocompromised and they took samples over many different days and they took samples on day 6, day 20, around day 30 and then around day 100 and around day 190. And what they were able to observe that as in the past studies we've discussed recently, the virus was evolving. So the virus was evolving not just in a spike protein but in other genes as well. 
So they were able to confirm that. And it was becoming more and more um, uh, capable of evading, neutralizing antibodies. So again, we, we've seen that pattern as well. We discussed that uh, before as well. But then what they also were doing is they actually studied these different variants isolated from this single individual along those six months and see what did those variants do to that syncytia formation, i.e. fusion of the cells versus cell death. And this is where it gets really interesting because what they were able to show is that the first strain that they isolated from these individuals behaved behaved similar to BAY, BA1 variant of Omicron, which does not form as much syncytia as say the, the original variant starting the pandemic. So we know that already, that basically the Omicrons was, is not as capable as, as forming those syncytia as, as, the, as the previous variants, including the original starting, pandemic starting variant. And they were able to show that, hey, this, this variant that was the first one that was isolated from that patient behaved kind of like BA1 Omicron in terms of syncytia formation. But it subsequently became, over time as it evolved, it became closer and closer in its ability to form syncytia towards the, the original starting variant of, um, of the, the variant of, that started the pandemic. It didn't match the quality of, uh, of syncytia formation, but it was becoming closer and closer, more like, i.e., it indicated that it was becoming more and more pathogenic in, in a way. They also studied the ability of the, those different variants that they were isolating in the duration of the, of the disease prog or infection progression in, in this individual. They were testing um, the, those variants for their ability to kill cells. And what they're able to show that the original virus that started the pandemic in their test was able to kill somewhere between 11 to 13 of the of the cells that uh, the in the culture that they were exposing uh, those cells to the virus versus BA1 Omicron was capable of maybe killing around 4% and now what it's interesting is that Omicron BA5 variant was around uh, capable of killing around almost 6% so you can see that even the uh, Omicron variants, as they're as they're evolving, they're capable of of be, they're slowly becoming more pathogenic, and we've seen this before in in animal studies. We have already made made a video on this topic in the past as well. But of course, animal studies does not reflect humans, so this is why I wanted to bring this up because this is the first video where we actually could be looking at um, at uh, studies involving humans. I want to show you the river behind me, people walking on the ice. <laughs> Uh, brave but right on and what was interesting is that the variant that's that the first variant they isolated in this particular patient HIV patient was actually behaving a really closer in terms of its ability to to kill cells as the BA5 Omicron version okay and as it was evolving in this individual, it was becoming closer and closer, more like the original variant starting the pandemic. So that by um, day, say, I think it was, I believe it was day 20, it was almost 7% uh, capable of killing around 7% in the cell culture. And then by day 30 and then subsequent variants was able to kill almost 10% of cells. So now it became in its ability to kill cells was similar to the to the variant um, that started the pandemic. So both of these studies, the ability to kill cells as well as the tests showing the syncytia formation indicate that in this particular individual, the virus was actually evolving to become more pathogenic. So once again, showing that that um, it the decreased pathogenicity is not a standard we should expect and the opposite can also happen and this is simply one of the first studies I've seen come across that showed that directly in a single individual. Now why would, why would Omicron want to evolve to become more pathogenic and this was interesting because of the, the proposition that the authors made is they mentioned that one possibility why this might happen is that now by becoming more pathogenic and more capable of creating the syncytia, meaning the virus can now cause 
fusion of adjacent cells with each other, then that means the virus doesn't have to be necessarily exposed to the outside and therefore it's not exposed to the antibodies. So it can actually escape neutralizing antibodies as well. And this could be one of the reasons why we could be seeing increased pathogenicity that is now slowly becoming evident that possibly that's exactly what's happening with what's happening with the Omicron. And the reason why uh, the authors were curious in this concept is because we don't know whether a virus is evolving like this towards becoming less pathogenic because of our own immunity is forcing it to or or are there other driving forces uh, of evolution that, that are causing this. But, and this is the, one of the propositions the authors made. So it overall the the topic of today's video from the authors is that it is not given that the virus will evolve towards being more and more mild although the predominance of our historical data suggests that but we are also in a very unusual circumstance where we have high level of virus in a highly vaccinated population and therefore there is a very high immune pressure acting on the virus. So we don't really know yet how the evolution of the virus will continue. And this hence why I'm looking at the science uh, of these topics. All right, that's all I'm gonna have uh, for you today. Thank you for supporting the channels. Thank you for all the comments. Thank you for the likes. Thank you for um, sharing the video. So please don't, don't forget. And of course, that's how we grow. And if you haven't subscribed to the channel, hopefully you will. And and uh, just the last reminder, we have another COVID Q&A uh, coming up uh, in, in the New Year's. And um, so hopefully we'll, we'll see, see some of you there. If you want free tickets to that, um, please subscribe to our newsletter and we'll send you a free ticket. So remember everyone, please stay healthy, please stay active <laughs> and, and uh, protect yourself, protect your immune system. And I look forward to seeing you in another installment of this video series. Bye everyone.